Welcome to the Transformative Leadership Summit. I am so excited to have my good friend, Bill Ziegler, on the Transformative Leadership Summit today. He is the author of Future Focused Leaders, which I am excited to be able to talk about with him today. So, Bill, thank you so much for being part of the Transformative Leadership Summit. Absolutely, Jethro. It's a pleasure to be with you today. And um, why don't we uh, just start by talking about what a future focused leader is? Yeah, you know, as a school leader myself, I, ser- I currently serve at a high school uh, in southeastern Pennsylvania, and I'm a big believer in being a future focused leader. Uh, that's a leader who works to prepare students and teachers for a world we can't see or we don't know right now. It's, it's someone that's thinking ahead, someone that's a visionary. But in, in my book, we talk about how there's three principles of being a future focused leader. And first is relate. And it's all about relationships. I know we talk about that all the time in school leadership, but, rare, but sometimes we don't live it out on a regular and consistent basis, uh, such as courageous conversations or you know, having those conversations with people that will help move a school forward. And, and so I think that's really important. So it's relate, all about the relate, relationships, the partnerships, the connections to really expand student learning. And then innovation. I think leaders need to be innovative. We need to think outside the box. We need to build schools that kids want to run to, not away from. And then finally, I think we need to work to invigorate people, to inspire people back to their original call of why they wanted to be a school leader, a teacher, a staff member, to make a difference in the lives of of students. And I think, you know, so many times it's easy to get away from our mission on why did we get into this field in the first place. And I think Every single one of us got into it with the the position and the passion of wanting to make a difference in the lives of students. So I think it's about relate, innovate, and invigorate uh, as a school leader. One of the fascinating parts about that is that none of us knows what the future holds. And yet we have to prepare kids for that. And so I always chuckle inside a little bit when the, you know, people say that kids aren't ready for, you know, steam uh, places that's based on what we what people are going into college right now but then we make all these big shifts uh, in education that's you know five to 13 years out before those kids will actually end up there and it's difficult to know what is going to be needed when those kids graduate and so uh, I think your your approach of relating innovating and invigorating are, are really important Let's talk a little bit about each of those and go into a little bit more depth. When you talk about um, relationships and partnerships with others, what are some of your suggestions for being able to help um, people who may not feel that comfortable reaching out and partnering with others? How, what's your advice to them who may not be comfortable with going out and chatting with anybody they meet? Yeah, not everyone is comfortable. I agree with you. That's a great point. And I think there's a few tips that I would encourage school leaders to build those partnerships that will extend learning for our students. First is don't do it alone. Grab someone to go with you, whether you're uh, in a school that have other school leaders like an assistant principal or dean students, or whether you're in a building that's just you and by yourself, maybe grab a teacher leader or a parent or somebody that's in your school community. So don't do it alone. Go out with someone and, and the other piece is go out with a strategic mission and a strategic plan. So go out uh, letting a company know about what your school has to offer and how they can plug in in strategic areas that they can plug in with volunteers. Uh, one of the things I, I share in the book is a, a, a vignette. We talk about a school uh, that actually has corporation volunteers come in to read to their students. I think it's important we do that. So um, number one, don't go alone. Number two, have a clear mission and plan. And then number three, try to fit into places that are natural for you. Get easy wins first and then dig into the harder, more challenging things. So if you know of a company where you might know the owner or you might know a manager or something, connect with that one first. Begin to build wins early and those give you confidence to do it more. As a school leader, being future focused and in the relationship aspect with connections is really critical to prepare your students for a world that they don't see. And I think we can do that by bringing in the businesses and bringing in the workplace to the schools, whether you're K through 12, but also taking opportunities out, getting your kids and your students out into businesses, corporations, and the community is key. And it's not even just about business. There's so many great social groups that school leaders need to be a part of. 
I'd encourage you as a school leader to get part of your Alliance Club, your Rotary Club, your Chamber of Commerce. These are excellent ways for you to build connections in a soft, easy way if it's not that natural for you to do that. Yeah, and when it comes to building those partnerships, sometimes it's difficult for us to to know how people could partner with us. And what are some of your uh, suggestions for figuring out how it would be appropriate to to partner with another company? I mean, we have a strategic plan, but that doesn't make a lot of sense in the business world. So how how can we figure that out? I think first off, look at what are the needs that you have in your school. So what are some needs? Maybe it's needs on having volunteers read to children. Maybe it's having uh, just having mentors talk to uh, students, maybe boys that are struggling with discipline and get some mentors from the community to come and connect with them. Um, I like how one school in, in Minneapolis uh, works near, their school is near a Target uh, headquarters and they actually have volunteers to come in and read. So find those easy to pick fruit right off the bat. So where do you need help? and look for corporations that are going to do that uh, and support you in that way. And then really, I think another piece is, is to look for a place to showcase your school. Realtors are a great place that, you know, as new people are moving in, getting them into your school, getting them to know your school. Senior centers, like for uh, the elderly, outstanding place for your school to plug into. You take elementary schools to the local senior center and have them sing, you just change the mindset of taxpayers that are voting uh, for you know, referendums on your school. And it's important that we build relationships with those communities. And then I think finally, we need to have an innovative mindset. When we go out, we need to look for opportunities to stretch our schools and our students by the helping corporations, whether it's our kids creating something for a business or our create, maybe our kids creating a business where we partner with another business. Uh, looking for opportunities to stretch the learning and make it more authentic for students. Yeah, those are those are great ideas. I especially love the idea of talking to realtors, and that's that's one of the things that on um, on websites that are selling houses like Zillow. Can think okay. of the name of that for a sec. They yeah. they have the ratings of the schools around on there, and <clears throat> as as we've looked at houses, the realtors. If they didn't have kids in that same area, they didn't really know what the schools were truly like. And so they would say, well, it says that the greatschools.org rating is, you know, four out of 10 or whatever. And you don't want to leave it to that to tell your story. I've looked at those reviews and they're, <laughs> they're not all that great. And so I think that's a great idea of reaching out to people in the community that you may not have thought of before. That I, I think is awesome. So let's go down to um, innovating. You talked a little bit about it by partnering with um, groups, by having kids create or do something special for the, for the group. But what are, what are some other ways that we can innovate um, in education right now? I think one of the big things is that school leaders need to have an innovative mindset. Uh, and what that does is that looks at school differently. It's not about using tech all the time. We can innovate in how we have students learning in the classroom. What does the classroom look like? We're moving away from rows. We're getting students into groups. We're getting, uh, we're using open spaces in the building to really use them as opportunities for students to work together and to collaborate. Changing the entire look of a school is really important. Without a renovation, you know, changing it by bringing in tables that are round tables and getting them. But it's also about having students create, design, and publish. Uh, having teachers no longer be the sole proprietor of work, having students creating, designing, publishing. Uh, we currently at our school, we're doing a thing on challenge-based learning where our students are looking for a, a problem in our community and then they're working to solve it. One that we have is uh, one of our students said, uh, told the teacher, hey, Mr. So-and-so, you know, when I went to elementary school in kindergarten, my backpack wasn't filled with any resources, uh, but everybody else's were. And so the students join together and they're raising funds to give pack packs for every kid in our school district that goes into kindergarten that's, you know, uh, socioeconomic status or, you know, uh, are with our economically disadvantaged. I think that's how we are innovative. We think differently. We think outside the box. I think it's time as school leaders we challenge the status quo in our own lives as school leaders, in our teachers, even our students. We need to look at how can we do school differently. How can we break down the walls and open the doors to have our students experience the world? Because one thing is, our students are no longer competing against the school across the street. 
They're now competing with schools throughout the country and throughout the world. So I think it's about getting students to create. One of the things we do is we have a makerspace where students can design and create and solve real problems with things that they actually designed. It's pretty awesome. I know a lot of schools now are making prosthetic hands, and we feature one of those schools uh, in the book about uh, how a, a school saw an issue with you know kids that can't get prosthetics, and they wanted to use their 3D printer to move forward and solve a problem for a student. Why can't our kids today in our schools be solving these problems? So what's a problem in your community, in your school, in your, in your area that your students could solve? That's how we're innovative. Innovation is not about technology always. It's a key component of it, but it's not the only piece. But with technology, I think it is key that we're integrating and engaging students with it. We talk about virtual reality and augmented reality. You know, gaming is going to it. You go to look at Xbox right now, one of the coolest things they have is that Oculus you wear and you play the game in real life. Why are schools doing that? I love what Brad Gustafson, an elementary principal up in um, Minnesota is doing, along with Darren Elwin, a digital principal of the year this year. They use drones and virtual reality to engage students in entirely new levels. I think uh, AR, VR, and I think drones are some really engaging ways that we can teach students things that we could never teach them before. Yeah, you know, here in Alaska, there are a couple of things specifically that pertain to that. Um, we have a lot of problem with uh, marine debris is what it's called, things that wash up on our shores. And so we have done many art projects throughout our schools to beautify our schools through the trash that we find um, on the the shores. And those are things that kids can really get involved in that they can be passionate about. And those are just so important. Now, when it comes to solving those problems, though, kids oftentimes feel inadequate or ill-prepared or incapable of doing that. How do we encourage and inspire them that they are capable of solving real problems, that they don't have to leave it up to the adults? You know, that is a great, great question. And I think we need to move away from engagement and move to empowerment. As school leaders, we need to have our teachers working toward empowering students, giving over the power and authority to them, but also providing them some dreams and some ideas to stretch them. So planting the seed, you know, maybe the uh, uh, looking at a school and grabbing a bunch of students that you know could create a prosthetic hand and say, look what's out there. Look at the problem that we have. How could we solve this? And I think it's about <clears throat> school leaders, first of all, modeling it themselves with their faculty and then having high expectations of their faculty doing just this with their students. Uh, an example of that is our, <clears throat> with our challenge-based learning, uh, we provided job embedded coaching where uh, we worked with them as school leaders uh, to train some of our teachers. And then we brought in an Apple coach to work on some job embedded coaching with challenge-based learning. And then what they did was work to turn over the, the classroom to our students. And I, I agree with you. Some people, some teachers, unfortunately, we have a hard time yeah. with that. Uh, but I think it's about the other pieces are planting a seed in their minds and getting them thinking, but having what they're passionate about. We need to begin to draw on what students are passionate about and, and ask them, what do you, what do you, rather than asking kids, what do you want to be in when you grow up or when you get out of school, ask them what problem they want to solve. What do they want to fix in the world? How, what difference do they want to make? Getting them to think that way early is key to being innovative as a school leader. Yeah, I definitely agree. So let's move on to the next part of that, which is invigorate. And you define that as helping people get back to their original call to be in education. Talk to me about how to, you know, how to encourage someone who feels so burdened by all the outside pressures and evaluation and, and all this stuff. How do you, how do you help them feel invigorated again? Yeah. Yeah. You know, first of all, the school leader has to be invigorated. I think the school leader has to return to the mission and the calling of why they want to do this. And to do that, you have to take care of yourself. It's a lot like when you're on the airplane. You know, I used to think that airbag comes down. I put it on my kid before I put it on myself. And then it dawned on me, if I put it on my kid first, I may not be there to put it on myself to help them if something else happened. I think the same is true with school leaders. We need to be prepared. We need to be equipped. We need to be inspired. That means you need to take time for yourself. You need to make sure you don't burn out, get physical activity, spend time with your friends, and then really challenge your teachers to do the same. And 
really work to inspire teachers to come back to their original calling. I think we do that also as school leaders by putting students first in everything we do, not making decisions in the school and what's best for the students, making decisions in the school, what's best. I mean, not what I said, not making decisions, what's best for teachers and adults and, and school leaders, but by, but by making decisions, which are best for the students. Yeah. And, and that sounds really easy. You know, we all say that we do that all the time, but sometimes other things get in the way and we don't put, put kids first. Um, what are some uh, questions or processes that we can use to make sure that we are um, putting the kids first when we feel challenged to, to not do that, to maybe be more adult serving than student serving? Yeah, I think the first thing is for school leaders and teachers to look at their systems, procedures, and policies they already have in place. What do they have in place? What's the handbook look like? Is the handbook relevant to today? Are we, are we designing schools in our handbooks and procedures and you know, student code of conducts that are no longer relative to students? You know, putting cell phones away, that does not become relevant. When we tell kids cell phones away, technology away, they don't see that as connecting. And I think that the first thing is look at your school procedures, policies, and, and code of conduct. I think the second thing is provide professional development for our school leaders, job embedded professional development, where we are modeling it. But here's the other thing. It's about giving student choice and voice. One thing we do at my school is we actually have students lead professional development for teachers. I'd really challenge school leaders, whether they're elementary, middle, or high school, I think students can be leading professional development for teachers. And that's a great way to really turn the leadership over to our students and empower them. The other thing is to encourage student voice in the classroom and to encourage student voice uh, throughout the school. So we listen to students uh, on a regular basis by pulling 16 students down randomly each week. And we ask them four questions. What can, I, what can our school to do? Uh, what's our school do great? What could our school do better? Uh, how, what do you dream our school could be? And what can you do to make it a better place? And, and through that, we ask our teachers those same questions. So it's constantly about working on increasing student voice, student choice in the school. But I think it all comes down to uh, the school leader. You can sense the attitude and personality of a school leader by simply walking down the halls and connecting with teachers. They need to see school leaders that are visible, that are trusting, that are out building relationships, and that are living the expectations that they expect from their teachers. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. Let's talk a little bit about that uh, students leading professional development for teachers. What kind of professional development are they leading? Like really good teaching and questioning practices, or or what? So they're not experts in teaching, but they are experts <laughs> in being students. Uh, we found that a lot of students know technology better than teachers do. One way that we could have them uh, leading school our teachers is by engaging them, having them talk about technology. For example, we had a student come in and actually talk about, uh, you know, how, how to use technology to engage and actually came alongside our Apple coach to do that. We also have a student-led group that's coming in to talk about uh, teaching students uh, of the LGBT community. And that, that uh, group that we have in our school wants to talk to teachers about what it's like to be a part of that community and how teachers can support them and what it's really just, you know, sharing their story. The other thing is we actually have students just getting up sharing their story with teachers about you know, how I learn best, what I connect with best, and when I, what, how do I know a teacher really cares about me? Um, we also had a student who actually gave an assembly on mental health and her struggles with mental health. She gave it in, in front of the entire student body, and she, she opened up about how her struggles with mental health and how she's working through them, and she's doing some amazing work in the area of mental health, and then she asked to provide professional development to our teachers. So during a faculty meeting, she actually walked our teachers through what it's like to be a student dealing with mental health. And I think it was really powerful to hear from the voice of students. And it models to the teachers that student voice for me is important. And I want them to model that same thing in their classroom. That's how we get back to the call of wanting to do what's best for kids. And I think it's a mantra that we all say. It's not a mantra we all live. And we need to begin to act out and live that out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Bill, that was just a brief overview of of so much information that you have packed in that book. Um, can you share quickly how people can, uh, can get that book? Yeah, there's two key ways you can get the book. Future Focused Leaders, Relate, Innovate, and Invigorate for Real Educational Change. It's really designed for school leaders. Uh, you can get it at chaselearning.org. That is chaselearning.org. Or check it out on Amazon. And if you do, 
you know, check it out on Amazon, chaselearning.org or Amazon. All right, cool. Thank you so much for being part of the Transformative Leadership Summit, Bill. Appreciate it. Thank you, Jethro. Take care.